to begin with, I just wonder as a kid, were you very much into animation or cartoons, TV, movies, whatever? <laughs> No, I hated it all. No, uh, <laughs> I was very much in animation as a kid. I think most are, but I, I, I remember thinking very early that, hey, guys do this for a living. I think I was about five at the time. But um, maybe it's because my dad, when he, you know, I don't remember him reading us like a Mother Goose things or anything like that, but I do remember him reading us Pogo comic strips, you know, uh, from the books that he had. So, and I think I remember being very enamored by the drawing of those uh so I was always interested in cartooning, always interested in drawing, very much interested in animation from, uh, you know, uh, Warner Brothers that was on TV and to uh, the Bullwinkle show to uh, the Beanie and Cecil show. Those sort of stick out in my mind. A lot of kids try drawing, but were you very into it and was there a point when you realized you were sort of good at this? I was into it from the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't, I think by the time I was seven, I realized that I was really getting good at this mm -hmm. and better than the, the average person. Yeah. yeah, and I guess, how do you go about pursuing that interest? Well, in, well, when I was a kid, I pursued it, I mean, I pursued it on my own by, mm -hmm. you know, drawing and uh, taking, sort of focusing on art in, in high school. Uh, and then when I got out of high school, I went to the University of Maryland with the intent of transferring to UCLA. But what I did there is I kind of focused on, on the arts and uh, drawing and, and, uh, and so forth. So yeah, then I followed through by going to UCLA to the animation workshop there. Uh, I was looking at USC. I was also looking at the Cal Arts, but I, for whatever reason, I picked U UCLA. I just liked the campus. There was a lot about you know the production of animation. Uh, a lot of it's obsolete now, <laughs> but at the time that I don't, that I didn't, you know, I didn't really know about or I hadn't experienced. So yeah, it was it was great. The other thing that, that it did is that I um, I was able to do uh, a film a five minute film that was my calling card. So that film was, uh, which it took me not only a undergrad, but going to grad school to finish it, but that film uh, proved quite valuable to me getting, uh, you know, people interested in me and getting work. Can eventually. you tell a little bit about it? What was that Oh, called? it was a film called The Strange Case of Mr. Donnybrook's Boredom. And it was a, an Ogden Nash poem of the yeah. same name, and I basically animated it. and. Interesting enough, the filmmaker Alex Cox, who was a student there at the same time, he did all the voices. And um, it was about the strange case of Mr. Donnybrook's boredom. And it was, you know, I, I kind of fully animated it, and um, people saw it, and they thought, oh, this is really good. Yeah, it won awards. It wow. won several awards, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it got the ball rolling. So you come out of grad school now, mm -hmm. and what was the first sort of opportunity to work for somebody doing this? Well, it's interesting. My, my work was uh, in animation and also in um, uh, illustration. So the first thing I did uh, was I was illustrating for the uh, Los Angeles Times, for the music critic at the time, Martin Bernheimer. Okay. And, uh, uh, and that led to me illustrating for Piano Books, a company called Alfred Publishing. In fact, those, <laughs> those books are still out there. Wow. And then, um, I don't know how I got this, I can't remember now, but I got a, a job working at uh, Ruby Spears Animation, which was doing Saturday morning cartoons like we did The Adventures of Mr. T <laughs> and Turbo Teen, about a guy who turns into a car. Uh, and it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a start, you know. And there was an, also a company called Laser Media. We did laser animation. Ooh, <laughs> so exciting. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's how it started. It was actually at the time, it was a little uh, slim pickings as far as animation goes. But I did meet this uh, uh, animator out of Cal Arts by the name of Bill Kopp, and he went to school with Steve Holland, who's also known as Savage Steve Holland. Okay. And he, there were two films that he did that were great uh, in, the, in the mid to late 80s, uh, Better Off Dead and One Crazy Summer. And One Crazy Summer, I didn't work on Better Off Dead, but uh, I, I worked on One Crazy Summer. Okay. So that's... Uh, and that led to The Simpsons. Well, I want to, okay, so you read the, anticipate the next question. Just how, <laughs> when and how did, did The Simpsons first cross your radar? What was the beginning? Well, it was interesting because at that time I was, re, re, I was hitting a sort, of an, a sort of a crossroad in my own career because I was thinking, do I want to do illustration or do I want to do animation, you know? And um, uh, a friend of mine who's a very well-known, uh, that then he was starting to get well-known, he's well-known now, Gary Baseman, mm -hmm. Uh, we went to UCLA at the same time, and he was doing very well as an illustrator, and I was, you know, I was kind of struggling. Mm -hmm. 
And I was coming to a point where I was going to say, you know, I'm going to forget about animation. I'm going to spend a year and just work on my arts, my own style, and uh, become an, an uh, illustrator like my friend Gary. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was at the end of '86, uh, and we had just finished uh, One Crazy Summer at the time. One of the animators was Wes Archer on One Crazy Summer, mm -hmm. and Wes had worked at a very small company at the time called Klasky Chupo. And Klasky Chupo got the contract to do the animation for the Tracy Ullman show. Okay. And that's how it all happened. And Wes got uh, me and uh, Bill Kopp involved. And we started doing that in March of 87. And so, yeah, I was there right at the very beginning. And that was sort of like, oh, I'll, uh, I'll do this for a couple of weeks. You know, I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll forego my... Plan A, and right. I'll do this for a little while, and then I'll go back to what I was, was doing. And that, of course, was The Simpsons. I gather that James L. Brooks was basically, he was producing Tracy Ullman's show and felt that it would be nice to have some sort of animation leading into it, but without any real specific <laughs> vision. Is that right? Well, uh, I imagine Jim probably could tell you better than I can. Okay. But what I understand it is that um, he had a, an original Matt Groening in his office that uh, his collaborator, uh, Polly Platt, had given him. And it was, he might have been something like, you know, and he, he's doing the, you know, getting ready to do the Tracy Ullman show, he might have even looked at that, so he said, we should get somebody like this guy to do animation interstitials on the show in between the skits. And uh, that's essentially how it, how it happened, from my understanding. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, Matt came in, and I think it's, it's fairly well known that Originally, they wanted him to do Life in Hell, and he didn't want to share the copyright, so he came up with The Simpsons almost on the spot. Uh, now, he came up with a, like the concept of it, but I think it was an ongoing evolution from week to week when he was giving us, you know, the script and the rough storyboard, how it evolved from there. But uh, so together, you guys were expanding this cast of characters and coming up with personalities and looks and things like that? Is that right at the beginning? Well, in the, the Tracy Ullman show, it focused it on the family, and the only other characters that came out of that was Grandpa, who is remarkably like the least change of any of the, <laughs> the characters for the Tracy Ullman show. And um, Krusty the Clown came out of that, and Itchy and Scratchy came out of that. Wow. And that's it. Wow. That's so it. it. At the beginning, it was, was it a once a week still just sort of developing these guys. Yeah, once, once a week, and we would do an, a, a minute and like 15, a minute 20, wow. and it was a lot of work. I mean, we were doing everything. We were like animating and cleaning up our drawings, and the next week they were painted, and the following week it was filmed, and uh, I think sweet, and I think it was about a four-week turnaround wow. for a Simpson uh, short. So in some ways, probably a lot closer to, you know, the short that we're ta here talking about now than the episodes you've been doing in the intervening 26 years. There was a, yes, I would say doing the short had a familiar feel to it. Wow, <laughs> you're going back to the full circle. <laughs> yep, right back to the beginning. So for, so for the last 26 years or so, you guys have been more of a success than you ever could have imagined. I mean, it really is as the longest running primetime yeah. animated sitcom. Yeah. It doesn't sound to me like you have a ton of free time on your hands, and yet you've on top of that taken on a feature six years ago and now the short. You know, everything's going great with the show. Why take on more? Well, um, well why not? I mean, the, the feature... And I, I should have said everything's going great with the series, not, not the short. Right. Why take on more? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the feature sort of was like everybody kept asking, when are you, when are you going to do a feature? As if we're obliged to do a feature. So... Um, we said, well, maybe we should. And, you know, at, at the time, too, anybody can check out where I'd, I... I didn't stick with it. There was a period that I wasn't working on the show because I had gone to DreamWorks and then I'd gone to uh, uh, Pixar. Um, and it was like during, I think, at the time I was at Pixar, there was more notions about making a feature out of it. In fact, I, uh, I think they really started to think about it around 2001, 2002. Uh, but... I guess the answer, again, it has to be, well, why not? You know, yeah. it seemed like the time was right for that. As far as the short goes, I couldn't tell you why, but uh, <laughs> it just seemed like a good idea. We were fooling around with uh, uh, experimenting with uh, uh, 3D. You know, what would it be like to be theatrically 3D just, uh, just you know, just for fun, mm -hmm. was without anything really in mind. And then, you know, uh, in the... Uh, 2011, uh, Jim Brooks had a meeting, and we all started talking about doing a short, and that's how that's how that bowl 
got rolling. So just, we're going to do a short, let's do it. Might as well do it in 3D. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, pay as well. Now, had anybody on the team <laughs> had experience in 3D? It's a whole new, different world from animation, well, regular 2D animation. Yeah, we, we were experimenting with uh, the ex uh, existing uh, material uh, just to see what would happen. And um, one, of the, one of our editors, uh, Roger, was practicing using, uh, um, using After Effects and uh, you know, adjusting the different layers of animation and see what sort of 3D feel we can get from that. So uh, when it came to doing that, we felt we'd had already kind of warmed up a little bit. And surprisingly, that was not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> really? It was, not, it was pretty easy acclimation? Well, I would say completely easy. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest hurdles was um, breaking down the characters and the backgrounds into a lot of levels yeah. in, in the cleanup process. Uh, but when it came to, we had this head of... Uh, 3D, uh, Eric Curlin, who is very experienced, and he, he found it very, uh, he, he made it seem very simple. I mean, wow. it's, I think because of his, let's say, nine or ten years of training, but uh, it, it, it worked out remarkably fast. And can you explain, I had read that something about, like, that there were ten layers or something. I don't really understand, like, when you would layer the animation. What oh, does that sure. mean? Well, you see, to get the sense of, of dimension and parallax, the only way you can do it is to take the characters and break uh, them down into various levels so you can shift them uh, a, a fraction of a pixel left or right. Okay. Uh, so, so it gives the illusion of depth when you put on the, the, the glasses. Basically, as a, you go, if, if the left eye is fixed, as you go to the right, it will have a sense of converging in space. To the left, it will seem to recede in space. So it's done so, all on the computer? Uh, in After Effects, yeah. Done okay. in After Effects. Uh, so uh, they, they, they have a program for it there. Wow. Uh, so, uh, so in Maggie's case, for instance, it would be like her pacifier and the handle of the pacifier, separate levels. We set it that our two eyes and our nose would be on one level. Originally, we thought we were going to separate the, no the two eyes and the nose, but uh, Eric assured us we needn't do that. If yeah. we want to get more dimension, he can manipulate that. Wow. Uh, her bow would be separate. Her, the outline of her head, the ear was separate. And the body was separate. Maybe the forearm was separate from the upper arm, you know, and uh, the or the hand might have to separate depending so on the close-up. Every frame is like a like a puzzle in a way, like not a puzzle, but a, a multi matting. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. It's like a, and each scene, I think the, the there was like a stack like this thick of cleanup drawings because everything had to be separated. Oh my god! Even a simple thing that like there's a we had a, I had a scene of Maggie's running across the room. Now normally that would just be one cleanup drawing for, but she was like several. Breakdowns, and then the background yeah. would be bro broken down to several level levels as well. Wow! So is it just coincidental that the two forays that The Simpsons have made into movies have both been directed by you, or do you have a <laughs> film inclination? You know. Well, I, I think they like my work. I've mm -hmm. done uh, a lot of. Uh, I, when in the, the beginning of the of the the show, they liked my episodes, and they made me supervising director. Uh, but uh, yeah, I found out that they I position myself because I did want to uh, direct the movie but they kind of wanted me all along for that That's and the same cool. for the short so why not I guess I guess I'm doing something yeah right. absolutely and um, and I guess so the feature was that a positive overall positive experience for oh, you yeah. yeah yeah absolutely no I it a lot of hard work but you know I, they, <laughs> Did well. <laughs> you did well, but yep. it would also, when I, while I was in it, I said, well, you better enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, this is why you came here in the first place. Yeah. You wanted to direct. Well, it's, it's grueling. It's rough sometimes, but have, keep smiling. Right. <laughs> so I want to ask you about the longest day care specifically and just why do it around Maggie. I think there's a reason I can imagine it makes sense if you're doing a four and a half minute short that you could do some interesting things. But why did you decide Maggie was the character to build it around? Well, it was decided pretty quickly in the first meeting we had that we would do it as a pantomime silent piece. And uh, Maggie seemed like the most logical character who, seeing that she doesn't speak, right. <laughs> to be silent. So uh, you wouldn't be asking questions, why isn't Maggie saying anything? So that's how it, that's how it came out, uh, pretty much from that uh, uh, perspective. And also, uh, it just sort of, it just came out. I think the other thing too, we wanted to be in a location that wasn't was like underused. And seeing as the Ayn Rand School for Tots, it was only used in a streetcar named Marge, uh, some in the very early seasons. Uh, that seemed like an ideal place. The other thing we wanted to do too is we, we wanted to avoid adult characters. In once we decided on Maggie, it was like in the tradition of the 
you know, Tom and Jerry or the Warner Brothers right. cartoons, you know, the many times adults were just shown from like basically the, the torso on down. And uh, that was the, even, even when Ma Marge is depicted, uh, I tried as best I can not to show her face. Was it always clear that this short was going to be attached to Ice Age 4, which was mm -hmm. for our kids? Yes, although I don't know if we would gear it. If it was attached to something else, we still would have done, done the same, same thing. thing. We, we had no one uh, thought of like, oh, it's a kid's uh, cartoon. No, that's never, never been any attempt on The Simpsons right. to make it for, for, for kids. Why yeah. does Maggie not speak, and, and with the exception of, of one time, I believe, and I wonder if you can also just share about that one time, because I believe it's pretty uh, memorable in the annals of Simpsons history. Very, very memorable. Well, um, you got to have, it's always good to have one pantomime character, so uh, she, uh, she fits that bill very well. And, um, well, she's only a little baby. She can't speak. After, after 20, all, all these years. After, she's been a baby for, as Homer pointed out, <laughs> she's been a baby for a very long time. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's the first thing. And uh, we had her speak uh, once, and that was, uh, of course, we had to find the ideal person to do the voice. And that ideal person was, of course, Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, it goes without saying, right? So... Uh, and she came in, and it was uh, what was what was the word, and how how many takes? I've heard there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of takes of that one word to the point she was, <laughs> she jokingly was, said a different word because <laughs> she was like, "What word do you want?" But the word was the word was daddy. Okay, very sweet, very sweet. And just for the record, was was this short conceived before or after the artist? Because you guys collectively have brought silent movies uh, back. <laughs> Well, it was after the artist, but I, it was almost like after we uh, <laughs> were doing it, like, hey, it's like the artist, isn't right. it? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what about, but, but it wasn't, um, it, it hadn't really, um, that wasn't really the, the point of inspiration, right. really. No, oh, no, no I'm know, just actually, teasing. Um, I'm trying to think we did the... You we, must have done this before. We, it was before the yeah. artist. It was actually before the yeah. artist. Let's, let's start back. It's they like, owe you an apology. Well, That's yeah. <laughs> but, but in a sense, I mean, it came out after the artist, but it was conceived before because this was conceived in 2011. Right. And uh, I hadn't heard about the artist until the end of that year. Right. right? That's when it came out. And we, we did our first storyboard on it at that point, and we kind of put a pin in it around June of, uh, of 11. Uh, we liked what we had done, but there's about it was still wasn't quite there. But we kind of had other things going, or wandered away from it, and right. picked up again in March of uh, 2012. So you mentioned Ayn Rand. What's what's up with Maggie and uh, the Ayn Rand connection? Because Jodie Foster had also voiced uh, the Howard Roark uh, sort of inspired character in season 20, I believe, with the <laughs> four great women in a manicure. And I'm just wondering, there's this uh, they come back to each other again now. Well, I think we just think it's funny. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's face it, Ayn Rand is, is hilarious. Yes. Listen to her name, Ayn. You know? Right. It's, it's, it's hilarious. That's not our real name. Right, right. You could look it up. It's not that. Uh, you know, it's a, so, and it existed in that, um, you know, that daycare, you know. If we had said <laughs> the Nietzsche school, right. it would have been Nietzsche, but, you right. know, it wasn't. We picked Ayn Rand Ayn back Rand. there in season three, and so we went back to Ayn Rand, and then... Actually, it was, it was also, again, it was in 2011, and by the time we were making it, there was all this brouhaha about Ayn Rand with the uh, crazy oh, yeah. election we just that's had. That's right, that's <laughs> right, I forgot. But everybody was going bananas about right. it. Right. And in fact, <laughs> before the film came out, there was some, I shall, shall we say, more conservative blog that was like, making fun of Ayn Rand. It's like, no, we're not. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. We're making some you know, passing jokes right. about it, but right. it's not like, it's not some diatribe or manifesto for or against. We just think she's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I had a statue in the back, in the background. Actually, it was in the first draft. It was actually in the beginning. There was a statue of Atlas going like this and then going. <laughs> so in the background, you can see Atl Atlas shrugging right. in one of the, in the, in the gifted school, but it's only a throw. I mean, that's a that's sort of funny. joking. No, it's great. Oh, making fun of mine. Oh, yes, we mustn't make fun of mine. Right. Rand. <laughs> so, um, and the plot itself, was it again that first meeting or was it something that evolved over a long period of time? In that first meeting, a lot of the plot came together. Uh, I think, um, I can't remember if the, the exact ending was, was there, but um, at some point that, that, that came up, like the, you know, the, 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 
the, the kind of the, the, the ending, at the twist at the ending. And, um, but a few things weren't in there. The, uh, the, well, I don't know how much do I talk about that. Well, yeah, I guess, <laughs> well, uh, in general terms, I guess. In we general could, terms, right. yes. There were, there were many pieces that weren't in there in the yeah. first, uh, not in the first meeting, certainly. I mean, that developed from that. But in, in my first story reel of it, um, I'd say a good half of it was there. Wow. There were uh, things taken out completely and replaced. And I think that they, mm, I think they make it stronger because it's a little bit more of a one story through line. Uh, the things that were taken out were really interesting, I think, visually, and they could be, and they worked regardless. But I think this has a stronger uh, impact because it stays within the sh context of a short. It's good to have one consistent idea. So if, if you were to compare the short to the average Simpsons episode in, in the sense of the amount of time that it took to animate, number of writers or animators that are involved with it, and the cost versus making a, a full episode. This was uh, a good deal, I would say, probably cost, costlier to, to make because of, uh, I think, the attention and also the, the sort of the breakdown mm -hmm. of what had to be done for the 3D. Um, in terms of the writing, um, it's it's not far afield of, of what the show involves in many respects. I mean, the, an episode would involve uh, uh, more writers working in the in the in the room to coming up with material. Uh, so there was less. There are a few, I would say, less uh, in terms of that. It's a it's in some ways it's comparable, in some ways it's not. I would say uh, because of the amount of time we spent on, you know, this uh, th these four and a half minutes was almost about the same amount of time we might spend on an episode wow. in terms of. Uh, but with a, I would say with a somewhat smaller crew, but just I guess the the sort of like the investment in 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 like in thinking about this each shot, uh, in terms of, I think in the average I'm working on an episode right now, and I think that well, that's quite a few scenes in this one. This it has a lot of cuts in it, wow. a lot of locations, but this has like th over 350 uh, scenes or shots wow. in it, and the short actually had about over 70. Wow. So it's it's comparable when you think about the number of uh, in ter terms of the number of minutes. It's still comparable to the the show in, in that respect. It got terrific reception right. from audiences and critics. Right. I mean, how gratifying was it for you to just see that after all that amount of time yeah. and work, it, it actually was going over? <laughs> well, it's one of my favorite lines from Singing in the Rain. It looks like our efforts ain't been in vain for nothing. <laughs> but uh, no, it was very gratifying. It was it was incredibly. Uh, I was very very happy. Uh, on the reviews that we got for it, and I was very happy from the audience uh, uh, reception for it. It was it, no, it was it was it was really great. It, it and made it all worthwhile. And did it ever cross your mind when you were making it that you might end up in this very elite group of uh, <laughs> of pre-existing properties, Mickey Mouse, Tom and Jerry, Bugs Bunny, that wound up at the Oscars in this category that you're now nominated for? Was it even on the radar? I don't think, I can't <laughs> recall thinking about it at all okay. while, while we're making it. Uh, we were just focused on, we had a pretty uh, demanding deadline and we had a lot of <laughs> problems to, to solve, if you will. There was a lot to, you know, to keep in mind and uh, uh, no, I, it didn't really cross our minds. We just, I kept waiting, well, how's the shot coming? Right, right, right. Let's see. I want, can't wait to see this in 3D. How's it going, Eric? And uh, you know, and like, what's the layout like, uh, you know, uh, Kev? What's uh, what's happening? So it was all all about that, you know, just excitement about every step of the way. Like, what's this? Is this scene coming out? Is the animation coming out right on this? So, what was the uh, reaction when the nomination did happen? The one award for which The Simpsons hasn't previously been uh, nominated. It must have. I wonder what that morning was like. It was. It was. It's still a little. <laughs> Shocking. I mean, I'm still kind of numb to the whole thing. It's like, really? This is really happening? I don't know. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's unexpected. I never thought that I would be in this situation. So I'm very, very humble and grateful right. for it. And finally, um, I guess I just want to ask you, as somebody who's been there from the inception, what's at the root of people's love for the show and the characters who are now making it to the big screen again? I, I don't really know. I think it's, there's a great deal of people identifying themselves with this family that seems to spend most of their time trying to make sense out of, you know, what's happening daily basis with in popular culture and in, you know, uh, workaday life. Uh, and they look really funny and the jokes are really funny. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of all these things. It's a combination of when we hit, you know, and now it's a long time ago, like in 
uh, late 1989. Uh, there was nothing like it uh, on it at all and uh, inspired, I would say, most everything else that yeah. has you know, succeeded it. And um, I don't know. Well, that's, <laughs> hey, whatever you're doing, you're doing something right. So. Exactly. I, yeah. I wouldn't change it for anything you know, right. because, you know, people said, wouldn't it be better if you did? No, nah, it, <laughs> it, it worked out pretty well. I wouldn't change anything about the past. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. You.